Okay. So, this is the last PowerPoint, PowerPoint G. Uh, it's the appendicular skeleton. I'll probably divide this one up into two, two lectures also. So, the appendicular skeleton includes bones of the limbs, the girdles, you know, the girdles attach the limbs to the axial skeleton, and ligaments. Um, so, let's look at this it's kind of weird but we just got finished with the axial skeleton and now we're talking about the appendicular skeleton so this is uh, the bones of the appendicular skeleton in this column you know they're divided into you know the pectoral girdles the upper limbs the pelvic girdle and the lower limbs and that's out of your book they may have, this is an older edition so yours might be uh written a little bit differently so the pectoral girdle and the upper limbs bones of the pectoral girdle include the scapula and the clavicle so if you look back here clavicle scapula okay uh the sternoclavicular joint you know from your uh clavicle to your sternum is the only direct connection of say you know that arm and uh you know that appendage to the uh, axial, you know, to the, this kind of written weird, <laughs> to axial of the skeleton, I guess it should say. Muscles and tendons loosely hold the pectoral girdle in place. So what's that joint, you know, from your humerus? Here's your humerus. And there's your scapula that it's articulating with that little fossa right there we'll learn in a little bit is called the glenoid cavity or I, I learned it glenoid fossa but your book says glenoid cavity now i don't know when that changed um but the glenohumeral joint is the joint and that's a commonly dislocated joint so now think back on the stuff you've learned already the glenohumeral that's a ball and socket so that would be triaxial you know motion wise it would be a um, it would be a uh, held together by a capsule, so it would be synovial, and it would be freely movio movable, so that would be a diarthrosis. So remember those classifications and mechanical movements that we gave you? All right, so there it is. There's the glenohumeral uh, joint right there. Okay, now this is showing you the scapula. Right. This is showing you the humerus. It's showing you the radius and the ulna. So you're in the anatomical position here. You're looking at the palm right uh, side. And so uh, this would be the radius, and that would be the ulna. Okay? So the bones of the pelvic girdle include the two coxal bones. We're gonna, I tell you what, let's just skip over this, and we'll put this on the last lecture so we're going to kind of divide this into upper and lower so we'll come back to this 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 okay so let's stick on the upper upper body so here's the scapula so this is a right scapula you're looking at the ribs and everything are out of the way so you're looking at the underside of it you know that would be against the ribs so this is the body of the scapula here um the fossa you know, this is like a giant dip, right? That's against your ribs. So it's a fossa, and they call that the subscapular fossa. So if you look at the way uh, the artist did this, they're taking this scapula and they're showing you here in, you know, a larger drawing. Okay? So everything with a box around it, that's fair game. Also in your lab books, uh, they should have all of these um, terms. Uh, they may have some more that may be necessary, like inferior angle. I'd put a box around that. Anyway, let's just look at the let's just look at the uh, at the structures or regions. So superior border, of course, is just the top border. Lateral border is this. It goes under your armpit basically. So that's also called the axillary border. Border, and then this would be your medial border which is pretty darn close to your vertebra, so they call it the vertebral border. Okay? Now, this is the acromion process. 
So it's actually, they kind of got this tilted so you can't see it, but it's actually kind of above the coracoid process. Right? So this is the acromion process, and this is the coracoid process. It's below it. Coracoid, by the way, means crow's beak in Latin. Okay? This would be the glenoid cavity. I learned it as glenoid fossa, but we'll take either one. Um, there's your lateral border again. Now you're looking at the back of the scapula. There's the acromion. There's a coracoid. That's a pretty good view of them there. Um, this is called the spine, the spine of the scapula. Remember, a spine doesn't always look like a spine, doesn't always look like a spine. you got to kind of use your imagination with some of these uh, terms. Anyway, but above that spine is a dip. What are they going to call that dip? Supra spinous fossa. It kind of just totally names it. Below it is another dip. What do they call that? Infraspinous fossa. I'm never going to ask body of the scapula. Don't don't even bother putting it. I'm, I'll probably put dip in your question. You know, what's the name of this dip? What's the name of this dip? And make sure you give me like supraspinous fossa, infraspinous fossa. Don't say body. I'm not going to be giving you that on this scapula. Put it right there and say, what is that little angle? giving you a big hint, inferior angle, okay? So, that's basically uh, what you're responsible for on the uh, scapula. There's two more things. I would put a box around, see this supraglenoid tubercle and this infraglenoid tubercle? Those are little bumps. They're not very good on our plastic models. And they're not very good on this drawing here, <laughs> right? But they're very important little bumps. So the reason they're important is, you know, like you have biceps brachii, the muscle here, um, that flexes your shoulder and your, and your elbow. Uh, one of the heads originates from here. On the back of your arm, you have the triceps brachii. One of the heads originates from here. So that's why they're important, because, you know, on muscle tests, one of those things are going to, at least one of those things is going to get asked. Um, so go ahead and put circles or squares around them here. They should be in your lab book, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay. Supra, above, glenoid tubercle, and infraglenoid tubercle. Glenoid, if I remember right, means, I think it means socket in uh in latin all right so here's a uh clavicle right oh you're looking at this is the right clavicle so look over here on this guy and they're drawing the arrow to show that we're making it larger mm -hmm. so that nice thing is there's only four things to know the sternal end and the acromial end because it pokes over there by the acromion process then you flip this guy over. This is the same clavicle. You just flipped him over, right? And you got two bumps. Put a box around that one and that one. They should be in your lab book. This is a tuberosity because it's kind of broad-based, and it's called the costal tuberosity, right? And this one they're calling a tubercle because it's a little more discreet. It's got its own name, conoid tubercle. Don't confuse that with coronoid, right? Remember, on the mandible, we had a coronoid process. There's also You also use that term in another couple of places. Um, conoid, C-O-N-O-I-D. So that's a tubercle. So this one's out further away from the midline. This is over here close, and it's sitting right above the ribs, hence the name costal tuberosity. Costal generally means ribs, okay? So your costal tuberosity would be like right there, and your conoid, uh, I mean, yeah, your conoid tubercle would be somewhere in there. <laughs> All right? So that's a nice thing. It's only four things to know on the clavicle. Then you go to the humerus, right? So the humerus, it's a long bone, first of all. <laughs> See, this is him here, upper arm. And then they're making it, uh, you know, drawing it bigger. So it's got two bumps, greater tubercle and lesser tubercle. It also has a head, right? See that articular surface of the head right there? That's mostly cartilage, <laughs> okay? Now, it has a neck, 
actually has two necks. <laughs> so this C going around that head right there, all the way around it, they actually call that the anatomical neck, where, where they drew a circle right here. They call that the surgical neck. I think they call it that because a lot of times it breaks right there. Oh, see right there. Surgical neck is a common site of fracture on the humerus. Okay. Then you got the shaft. Uh, call it a diaphysis, right? I generally only give half a point for the word shaft. Um, and then there's the deltoid tuberosity. So the deltoid tuberosity. Um, you know, it's a broad based bump, your deltoid muscle and your, you know, that's where you get a shot sometimes, you know, at the doctor in an intramuscular injection is that big muscle up there at the top. Um, okay. Um, it has a tendon. So the deltoid would be like right there, right? The muscle. And then it has a tendon that attaches here, which pulls a bump. Right? And so that bump would be the deltoid tuberosity. Go on down to the bottom, and you have condyles. Um, above the condyles, you have epicondyles. Now, the way I learned it, you had two separate condyles down here. One was called the capitulum, and then from here to here was a condyle called the trochlea. The way your book describes it now, they're calling this, this whole thing one condyle with two separate parts. Doesn't matter, it's just semantics, right? So they're calling the capitulum part of that condyle and they're calling the trochlea part of that condyle. I don't care, even so much so, like if you totally blanked, and you couldn't remember capitulum, which means like a little bitty skull cap, it looks kind of rounded, um, and you accidentally call that lateral condyle, I'll give it to you. And if you accidentally call the trochlea medial, condyle I would give it to you but try try to call them capitulum and trochlea because that's pretty much that's pretty much what everyone calls them now all right so above them you have a lateral epicondyle and a medial epicondyle see this dip this is on the front remember you're looking at the front this is this one in this position here or a noid fossa so Remember, it's spelled just like the coronoid process on the mandible. It's a generic word. Coronoid means crown. So there's a little coronoid process that will, on the ulna, that goes into this dip. Okay, so make sure you spell it right. Coronoid. Okay. Now, let's flip this guy around. And there's the back, right? You can see the anatomical neck really well here. All right. Um, this dip is a lot deeper. And it's called the olecranon fossa. Okay. Um, so the olecranon fossa. So the olecranon process on the ulna goes into there. We'll we'll get to that when we get to ulna. Okay. So you can kind of see the trochlea here. Um, can't really see the capitulum very well. Mm -hmm. So. Anyway, that so let's re re uh, visit everything, so everything with a box. But just think about this in your head. You have on a uh, humerus, you have a head. That's one landmark you're responsible for. You have an anatomical neck, surgical neck. That's two and three. Greater tubercle, lesser tubercle, four and five. Deltoid tuberosity. That'd be number six you're responsible for. Two epicondyles, seven and eight. Technically, two condyles, nine and ten. A dip here would be number eleven, and a dip here, a lecanon fossa, would be number twelve. There's one thing I left out. Actually, I have done this. See that groove that's in between your two uh, tubercles? That's the intertubercular groove. Now, in your book or uh, or some atlases, they may actually call this the bicepital groove because a tendon from your biceps goes right here. I say intertubercular, it's a little more descriptive, right? Okay, so really, what's that make it? 13 things to know? Not counting the shaft, or see, I did it. Uh, diaphysis, <laughs> right? Uh, so I guess technically 14 things, huh? And that's the way you got to think of it. You get a bone, you say, how many landmarks? 
or regions or areas on this bone am I responsible for? And then you just write them out and then get to where you can just visualize that bone in your head and then write the landmarks out. Or you can draw it on a sheet of paper if that helps. Sometimes that helps. Okay, let's look at the ulna in the radius. So on the ulna, so it's got that big U-shaped notch right here. That's what's going around the trochlea. So guess what they call it? The trochlear notch. There's this big old guy up here. That's the olecranon process. There's this little bitty process down here. That's the coronoid process. Okay. Now, you can't really see it here, but see where the radius is rubbing on this, this right here? That's the radial notch of the ulna. Go down to the bottom. And they're calling this the head of the ulna. And then this is a little process called a styloid process. Styloid, like a, it's from the same root word that, that, that uh, for stylus, you know, like a pen, a writing utensil. So it kind of looks like a little writing utensil. I want you to notice the head of the ulna is down here and the head of the radius is up here. So head actually has nothing to do with top and bottom on these bones, right? Uh, basically, the head is what's rubbing a little notch in this case. And so you'd be rubbing a notch on the radius right here. And so they would call it the ulnar notch with the radius. And then the radial head would be rubbing a notch on the ulna. And they would call that the radial notch of the ulna. Radial notch of the ulna. Ulnar notch of the radius. <laughs> See how that works? All right, so let's look at the radius now. Oh, so let's think back. Basically, six things. Check your lab book because I don't know if they gave you ulnar tuberosity or not. I can't remember. If they did, it's fair game. If it's not in your lab book, don't worry about it. Um, so you got electronon process. That's one thing. Trochlear notch. That's number two. Coronoid process. Coronoid process number three, don't forget, electronon process number one. Then you have a radial notch of the ulna number four. Then you have the head down here of the ulna number five, and then the styloid process number six. Okay? Um, that's pretty easy. And now let's look at the radius. Oh, that's just the electronon from the back. Oh, one thing, just for your own info. In the old days, this trochlear notch, they used to call it the semi-lunar notch, like a half moon. I kind of liked that, and I'll tell you why later. Um, so if you totally blank and you can't remember uh, trochlear notch and you put semi-lunar notch, I'll give it to you. Okay. Don't very many people call it that anymore. Maybe some older dots, but... Um, I'll still give you, give you credit if that's what you put. Okay, now let's look at the radius. Here's the head, and then this big old broad base bump right here is radial tuberosity. That should have a box around it. And then way down here, you got that um, you got that ulnar notch of the radius where it's rubbing right there. You can't really see it. And then you got a radial, you got a styloid process, just like you have a styloid process over here. Um, so four things, not counting the diaphysis or shaft. Okay, so four things to know on the radius, six things to know on the ulna, unless they gave you that little ulnar tuberosity. Check that in your lab book. All right, so there's your electronon. You don't even have to say process because it's just become more common to just call it the electronon. Okay, uh, there's the radius that we were talking about. There's the head of the radius. There's a radial tuberosity. There's the radial styloid process of the radius there. And there's the ulnar, uh, the ulnar notch of the radius. All right, so let's go down to the hand. Uh, so the, you're looking at the palm side view. Here's your radius, right? And the radius is articulating with this great big guy right here. It's called the scaphoid. Bone. And then this that's articulating with the ulna is called the lunate bone. So these two, I ask quite a bit. 
you know, because say you fall and you crush, you know, you land on the palms of your hands very forcefully, you might crush the scaphoid or you might crush that lunate bone, you know, because all that force is being driven onto there. Um, and so that's why I have boxes there. But technically, I think they're wanting you to do all of these now. Um, back in the old days, we'd just do scaphoid, lunate, and capitate right here, capitate. Because those are ones that are commonly injured. You know, like if you somebody gets mad and they, and they hit the wall with their fist, a lot of times they'll break that capitate, right? Skateboarders landing on their, on their palms of their hands, they sometimes crush these two guys. So there's a little saying, it's kind of stupid, but it works. It's, um, she likes to play trumpet to comfort herself. Um, so it's kind of weird. You got to go in a certain order. You go from left to right, and then you go from left to right. So scaphoid, she likes lunate, so the first letter of each you know, one of those words is, it's a mnemonic, in other words. She likes to triquetrum, right here. Play, pisiform. I've heard it pronounced pisiform, but I say pisiform, right? Uh, and then you go back over here, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. It almost looks like a little hammer coming down off of it. This is coming towards you, right? So she likes to play trumpet to comfort herself so kind of burn that little singing in your brain it'll give you the first letter of each one at least um so any of these are now fair game i think the nursing schools wanted us to do that um so you might as well just sit down and memorize them you can you can write down your little mnemonic and then see if that helps oh by the way if you look at a really old atlas of anatomy. They might call this scaphoid the navicular. You do have a navicular bone in your foot, and they also call, you know, navicular means boat, by the way, like navy. Uh, I think, if I remember right, this was before my time, um, I think they also used to call this the navicular up here, too. So, I would probably give you half a point if you said that. Um, but scaffold go with scaffold that's that's what everyone calls it now all right now um this these are metacarpals these are little bitty long bones remember because they have epiphyseal lines or, or plates if you're young and growing these are considered short bones okay so you got to name these by number Metacarpal number one over here by the thumb. Metacarpal number two. Metacarpal number three. Metacarpal number four. Metacarpal number five. So you got to be able to name these things so that if you're talking to someone on the phone, they can identify which bone you're talking about. Say, oh, we got a patient and he broke his fifth metacarpal on his right hand. Right? You don't even have to say right and left if I'm pointing at these. I assume you'll know them. All right. Or he broke one of these. So these are called phalanges. Right. Um, phalanx is singular. Phalanges is plural. Or you could say he broke the proximal phalanx number two. Or he broke middle phalanx number two. Or he broke the distal phalanx number two. So if I put a piece of tape or a pointer, say I put a pointer right there. You would go middle phalanx number four. Distal phalanx number five. Here's where you get in trouble. Look on the thumb. Where's the middle phalanx? It doesn't have one. It just has a proximal phalanx and a distal phalanx. See right here. Proximal phalanx and a distal phalanx. Okay. So this is where students make a mistake. If I went A, B, C on the thumb, right, on the thumb side. The student might accidentally go, proximal, middle, distal phalanx. Wrong. You just missed. You just, uh, you just missed uh, two of them, <laughs> right? If you said, if you said proximal, middle, 
distal phalanx. You miss this one because that's metacarpal number one. You miss this one because that's proximal phalanx number one. And then this, you know, it's still distal. So uh, you got one right. <laughs> okay. So be careful. Make sure you know that this is a metacarpal. This is a phalanx. That's a proximal phalanx, number one. And that's a phalanx proximal. I mean, sorry, distal phalanx, number one. All right. So we good. So, you know, I can go like A, B, C, something like that. D for the scaffold or whatever up there. Okay, so make sure you check that out real close. All right, so don't forget your little mnemonic. Make sure you learn these guys, especially learn scaphoid, uh, lunate, and capitate. I do still tend to ask those more, but any of them are fair game now. Oh, by the way, see this lunate bone? You know, lunate, that means moon, basically, I guess. Uh, so that's why I liked the old name whenever we were talking about the semi lunar notch because it kind of gave the ulna a moon theme so we had a semi lunar notch up at the top and then that uh bone articulated with the lunate bone down at the bottom it just helped it just helped me remember the things right so the semi lunar notch at the top the bottom of it articulates with the lunate bone you know in the carpals so anyway they go trochlear now, so whatever floats your boat. Okay. Um. All right. I think we're good. What's that? No, it's not even not even thirty minutes. So I guess we'll cut it off there, and then we will um do that other uh thirty minute lecture and put these up on YouTube for you. All righty. Okay.